Welcome to Lecture 1 in Chapter 2. In this chapter, we're going to talk about several issues related to internal controls. The first aspect relates to fraud and the implications to auditors. Keep in mind that one of the things that we as auditors do, the primary thing that we do, is provide an opinion of the fair presentation of the financial statements. So what we're looking for is we are looking for material misstatements caused whether due to error or fraud. Now, you notice here in the slide here that errors occur unintentionally. So we're looking for the material misstatements whether due to error or fraud. We're not going to be talking about errors in this lecture. What we're talking about is fraud. The key difference between an error and a fraud is that fraud is an intentional act. It is an act involving the use of deception that results in a misappropriation or a misstatement of financial statements. There's two types of frauds that we focus on. The first is misappropriation of assets, and the second type of fraud that we will deal with is fraudulent financial reporting. When we talk about asset misappropriation, basically what we're talking about is employees stealing assets from the organization. Examples of this may be skimming cash, stealing inventory, payroll fraud, certainly an executive that is misusing his or her expense account would also be considered asset misappropriation. Notice this point here that states that a dominant fraud scheme perpetrated against small businesses is asset misappropriation. Well, why is this? Well, primarily this is because in a small organization, we do not have the ability to have the control mechanism such as segregation of duties. And a small firm may in fact place more trust in an employee than a larger organization would. And in fact, uh, it's very typical for a small organization to have trust in an employee and then find out years later that this uh, employee has been scheming against the, the organization for many years. Keep in mind that perpetrators are commonly employees. And we want to make the point that when we talk about misappropriation of assets, generally speaking, with the exception of uh, the, the issue of travel expenses, the misappropriation of assets or the stealing of assets generally occurs at the employee level and not the executive level because the executives have bigger things to talk about, bigger things uh, to, to, to focus on. And what we're talking about here is fraudulent financial reporting. Fraudulent financial reporting is the intentional manipulation of reported financial results to misstate the economic condition of the organization. Common ways to do this include manipulation, falsification, or altering of accounting records or supporting doc documents, misappropriation or omission of events or transactions, and the misapplication of accounting principles. So what we need to find out is we need to understand the background of fraud in, other, in order to sort of understand what internal controls we need to establish. The key theme or the key uh, theory related to fraud is what we call the fraud triangle. The fraud triangle is looking at fraud from the perspective of opportunity, incentives, and rationalization. So the idea is that an employee or an executive is going to look at fraud from the perspective of what can he or she get out of the transaction. The rationalization is being able to justify his or for her decision, and the opportunity is basically focusing on the lack of internal controls within the organization. So the key piece related to opportunity is this is something that management can alter based upon the internal control structure. You notice also that there is what we call pressure components of the fraud triangle. This may be personal pressure, uh, corporate or employee pressure, as well as uh, possibly external pressure. 
Personal pressure may be that the individual has a gambling problem. Uh, corporate or employee pressure may be that the uh, senior management of the organization is telling you that if you don't meet your results, you're going to get fired. External pressure may be external pressure coming from stakeholders, from shareholders that are demanding certain things to take place that from a realistic perspective, you're not able to manage this. The incentives to commit fraud are many. We're going to focus on a couple of these things, but what you notice here, the personal incentives may be greed, addiction to gambling or drugs, but also management compensation schemes. So if management is going to be compensated with bonuses based upon specific outcomes, chances are these are the outcomes that management is going to focus on. And frankly, if they're not going to get the outcomes based upon their activity or their value they pr uh, provide to the organization, it very well may be that they're going to attempt to meet these compensation goals based upon fraudulent reporting. Opportunities to commit fraud. Again, think about opportunities from the perspective of internal control structure. So if the internal controls are not there, then management is looking at this and they're saying, or the employees are looking at this and they're saying, hey, listen, I need the money, I need to do what I need to do, and the opportunity is there because the controls are not in place. So what are we looking at? Well, the first thing you notice it here it talks about is significant related party transaction. It's very possible that you have taken advanced accounting or you're taking advanced accounting now. One of the things that we talk about in advanced accounting is related party transactions, whether they're equity uh, relationships with other organizations or where we have uh, ownership where we consolidate the financial statements. Some of the complexities related to this is extracting out those non arm's length transactions. In other words, these related party transactions. So related party transactions, as you are determining in your advanced accounting class, are very complex. This is an area where organizations or individuals within organizations view as being opportunities for fraud. So. There's nothing wrong in and of itself of related party transactions, but if an, or, if an individual was interested in committing fraud, there's no question but that he or she would focus on these related party transactions. And in fact, when we conduct our initial risk assessment of the organization, we are very interested in finding out what types of related party transactions there are. Now you notice uh, the third item here management's inconsistency involving subjective judgments. Well, one of the things that uh, is clear as we are reporting our financial statement results is that there's many things within the financial statement that are management's decisions. Management decisions related to, as an example, uh, uh, the allowance for doubtful accounts. Uh, when you look at the assets, we're looking at useful life, uh, the uh, the uh, the way that we actually uh, do the depreciation, uh, all of these things create uh, subjective decisions that management needs to make. Lower of cost or market is another subjective judgment. Now, one of the things that we say as we're working through this from an audit perspective is that management should be making these decisions based upon objective uh, an objective view of the facts and circumstances without regard to how these decisions impact the financial statements. What happens in what we call earnings management is management is looking at a final number that they want to come up with and this final number may be because this is a number that meets their requirements to get the new bonus and they will then insert the subjective judgments, these management decisions in terms of estimates in such a way that they're able to meet this decision. Now, as you can see, is it's very hard from an auditor's perspective is to 
understand the judgment criteria that an organization makes when they're making these judgments. So this is actually an area that a auditor needs to be very concerned with as he or she is considering the audit. And frankly, one of the things that we need to consider is the ethical standards related to senior management. Uh, you see the next item here, complex transactions. Anytime there are complex transactions, this is an opportunity to commit fraud. And again, we're talking about opportunity. We're not necessarily saying that it is happening, just that the risk is there. Ineffective monitoring of management by the board. And then you notice the last item, weak or non-existent internal controls. So as we're looking at opportunities, what we're talking about is the complexity of the organization. We're also talking about the control structure with the organization. And as we've talked about in the earlier slide, is in a small organization, it's actually more difficult to develop these internal controls to uh, minimize the risk related to fraud. The last piece of the uh, fraud triangle is the rationalization. So this is where the drug addict or the gambler is able to justify his or her be behavior. The rationalization involves reconciling unlawful or unethical behavior. The rationalization for fraudulent financial reporting may be, hey, we've got to save the company. This is the only way we're going to be able to do this, and next year we'll make this up. Rationalization for misappropriation of assets, maybe the employer is able to justify his or her uh, stealing assets by saying, you know what, I've been mistreated by this organization, I have a sense of entitlement because I've been here so long and nobody understands how much I work. I'm not getting the raises that I need, therefore I'm going to take from the organization what I believe is mine. Rationalization, we're certainly not justifying that by any means by saying this, but this is what the fraudster is considering when he or she is looking at the transactions that they're, that they're going through. So what we want to do next is to describe the implications for the auditor related to fraudulent reporting as well as what we're talking about here, the COSO report on fraud. Now, we're going to defer our discussion related to COSO in our next discussion, but we do want to talk about the implications of fraud and especially the fraud triangle as it relates to our audit. So the auditor needs to keep the following things in mind when he or she is conducting the audit. We need to understand the pressure created for top management by analysts in regards to meeting earnings expectations. And this is basically a part of the risk environment that we consider when we are considering the entity and its environment. Are the analysts basically dictating what the earnings should be in upcoming periods. And if there's too much pressure, it's very possible that this pressure may in fact infiltrate senior management as they're making decisions in terms of attempting to meet this. Before completing the audit, sufficient time should be allowed to examine major year and transactions. So what are we talking about here? Well, it's very possible that the organization has not met, as an example, sales transactions. So guess what? At the last 15 days of the year, there is a sales transaction that represents 5, 10, 20% of the total sales for the organization. This would certainly be something that we'd be interested in looking at because this may in fact not be a completed sales transaction that should be reported on the financial statements and it's very possible that it is something that may in fact have some sort of fraudulent uh, attribute associated with this. Especially if there are potential problems with revenue. So again, what we want to do as part of our risk assessment is start looking at the organization not only in terms of what they're doing, but maybe what they've been doing or what they were expected to do based upon their budget expectations. So if we see that they are working 
below budget in terms of revenue, we certainly want to examine transactions at year end, especially major year end transactions, to make sure that these transactions are in fact appropriate. We need to understand complex transactions to determine the economic substance, the parties that have an economic obligation. And again, many organizations do have complex transactions, but we need to understand these from the perspective of are these true transactions that are reportable on the financial statements. And ultimately, we need to understand and analyze the weaknesses in internal controls. So as we talk about, and we're going to talk about the audit risk model throughout this course, but when we're looking, we're looking at audit risk, what we need to understand is the risk of material misstatement. Part of the risk of material misstatement is understanding the internal controls that management has implemented in regards to uh, counteracting the inherent risk of transactions and account balances and inventory and assets and so forth. The third party COSO report. Uh, one of the things that we will talk about in a later uh, uh, discussion is the COSO and how it, uh, what the implications are in regards to the internal control framework. But at this point, is all we want to talk about is some major findings related to the COSO report. And the COSO is the Council of Sponsoring Organizations. So major findings are the amount and incident of fraud remains high. So people are still stealing. Uh, it hasn't stopped. It didn't stop uh, before the financial crisis. hasn't stopped after the financial crisis. People are people. So that fraud triangle remains in place. The median size of companies perpetrating the fraud rose tenfold. So not only has it uh, uh, been high, but it actually has increased. There's heavy involvement in fraud by the CEO and CFO. Most common frauds involve revenue recognition. So you notice we focused on revenue as we're looking at this. And again, complex transactions, year-end transactions, these are the kinds of things that we need to focus on. One third, third party, one third of the companies changed auditors during the latter part of the fraud. Well, why did they change auditors? Well, maybe they changed auditors because the auditor was beginning to understand what, the, what fraud was taking place. So what is the takeaway on this? Well, one of the things that uh, we talked about in our last week's discussion related to bringing in new clients. We certainly don't want to bring in a new client that is changing to us because the prior auditor has identified some fraud. The majority of fraud took place at companies that were listed on the over-the-counter market. And again, we're talking here smaller type organizations. So what we want to discuss now is the auditor's fraud related responsibility and user-related expectations. The Center for Audit Quality recommends three ways in which individuals involved in financial re reporting process can mitigate the risk of fraud. The need to acknowledge the existence of a strong, high ethical tone at the top of an organization. So the key phrase here is the ethical tone at the top. I'd mentioned a few slides ago how ethics become extremely important in relationship to management and their decisions related to creating estimates related to the financial statement. So from an auditor's perspective, we certainly need to understand the ethical tone of the organization. We need to consistently exercise professional skepticism in evaluating and or preparing financial reports. So we're talking not only the auditor, but also people within the organization. And certainly one of the things that we need to think about is the people within the organization need to have the ability to understand that they really do have a role in the preparation of the financial reports and the ethical, uh, ethical nature of these reports. 
We also need to understand the role of strong communication in the financial reporting process. So the final message to the auditor, and this is going to be our last slide here, is we as auditors need to assume greater responsibility for detecting fraud. We need to provide assurances that the financial statements are free of material fraud or free of material misstatements, whether due to error or fraud. And in this discussion, we've certainly had a focus on fraud. We're going to have a couple more discussions related to this. This is a fascinating topic and it certainly is critical to our understanding of the nature that, auditor, that the auditor has in relationship to detecting and measuring potential fraud within the organization. Okay, thank you.